And so I just want to uh, say thank you for that and encourage you to participate in the consultations that we're going to be having, the collaborations that we're going to be having this year. It's really important for us to get that feedback, and here at Wikimania, this is the perfect opportunity for it. And one of the reasons I'm going to want to introduce you to the team, I'd like you to get to know them, come up and talk to them afterwards, is because it's so valuable when we sit down and talk. Uh, we just had a meeting yesterday with the chapter head about um, some trademark policy things, and um, they had some really great ideas about what we were doing and uh, or what we should be doing and some things where we think we can really find solutions that we hadn't thought of before. So I, I'd like to urge you to use Wikimania to get to know us a little bit, uh, try ideas out on us. Uh, we personally love it. We'd like to get our heads out of the law books. Uh, you are what it's all about, and it's, it's quite exciting. Okay, I'd like to introduce to you the team. Um, we come from a world, uh, in our former lives, we were in, in worlds of being trial attorneys, appellate attorneys, law professors, diplomats, programmers. We come with a lot of different perspectives, which I think is quite useful. Um, I used to be a street musician in Paris. Michelle is a beer maker today. Those experiences probably prepared us most for uh, <laughs> this uh, position. <laughs> yeah, right, um, right, exactly. Um, now, of course, um, we usually like not to prioritize team members, but I think we all know our most important team member is Rory, our uh, team mascot. Now, Rory is a stuffed uh, tiger and has taught us, um, is trying to teach us the principle that your strongest arguments are made with the fewest words. Um, I'm not someone who's really good at that, and um, so I'm going to try to keep this presentation relatively short to give you time to ask questions. So let me start with the introductions after Rory. So I'm Jeff Brigham, and I know Wikipedians and Wikimedians uh, appropriately do not like credentials. Uh, I've asked my team to talk a little bit about their background, but only to let you know who they are, uh, give them sort of a, big, uh, a, a bit of context as to where they were before they came here. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty sensitive that we don't want to at all. Uh, the, I, I've been practicing law for about 25 years, and about 10 of those years I've been handling global internet um, uh, legal strategies and risk uh, portfolios. Um, I, spent, I spent about 10 years living overseas uh, uh, in Europe, um, advising there as well. So that gives me a little bit of background uh, that uh, has uh, been able to facilitate me in sort of this next adventure as general counsel, which um, is definitely the most challenging job I've ever had. And with that, um, let me pass it off to Lewis. Um, Lewis is uh, our deputy general counsel. Hey, I'm Lewis Villa, the uh, deputy general counsel. Uh, I My six-month anniversary at the foundation is next week. Uh, however, I've been involved in uh, free software and open source software for uh, almost exactly 15 years. And uh, sort of the, that's the community I come out of. I was, uh, I assume like some people here in the audience, uh, some of you are wiki lawyers in the better sense of the word. Um, I, I was uh, an amateur open source uh, license, you know, uh, fanatic and, uh, and then at some point said, wait, maybe I could actually make this a job. And um, so far, so good. So, um, you know, I've worked uh, at Mozilla before this, uh, worked on the Oracle Google uh, litigation last year as well as, you know, some of my legal background. And, uh, um, yeah, and I, this is just a dream come true. You know, Jeff said something about uh, one little biographical note about why I chose to come here. Jeff said something about how good it is to work with the community to write documents. And that is something that is so unique. I enjoyed doing that in Mozilla and uh, where I got to rewrite their, their license. Uh, slight pitch, Stephen and I will be doing a licensing talk next. So, um, but uh, you know, I got to do that and to get the opportunity to do that uh, all the time on a regular basis on a wide range of documents is just something I think is, uh, it's, it's already a lot of fun. It's gonna keep me a lot of fun for a long time. So uh, I'll give it to Michelle next. Stay sitting so I don't have to over myself. Um, I'm Michelle Paulson. Um, with the foundation and I've been with the foundation since 
since 2008 as a volunteer and then full time as an attorney since 2010. Um, I came in actually under a three channel council by Godwin and have had the opportunity to touch pretty much every sort of legal issue that the foundation has faced over the past five years. Um, and I've been extremely lucky to do so. Why I came to the foundation um, is honestly, it's so rare and such a privilege to be able to fight for the good side. Um, as a lawyer, it is really hard to find a position where you can do that, and I am really lucky to be able to fight for users and everything that they do, fight to keep content up, fight to, for user privacy, and fight to keep it so that we can have this world of open knowledge um, worldwide. Who likes to fight? I do. <laughs> Michelle uh, has a number of portfolios. One of them is our uh, <coughs> Um, my name is Stephen Laporte. Um, I am a legal counsel as well. I've been at the foundation for a little over a year now. Um, I came out of the Wikimedia community. I'm a wiki sourcer and an English Wikipedian. The wiki source. Uh, no other wiki sources here? No? <laughs> yeah, wiki source. So um, I've been there for about a year. I focus on movement governance, so I write agreements and uh, try and make our policies a little bit easier to read. Uh, I'm also a copyright enthusiast and a weekend Python and JavaScript hacker. Um, so a lot of uh, Wikipedians like to pretend like they're lawyers, so I like to pretend like I'm a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen is most famous right now for that visualization of that, that sound visualization of edits that you may have seen in the past 48 hours. Uh, that, that's our legal team. <laughs> so when you look at other major websites, um, they're usually backed up in cases of Facebook or Google or eBay by scores of lawyers, if not hundreds of lawyers. And here, uh, our legal team consists of, well, I think, a third of lawyers, because I count as the third. Um, in a world where we're the fifth most popular website in the world. Now I say that, um, but it's actually not an accurate statement because in some ways the legal team is 100,000 in five and a third because it actually includes you as a community. And I said this last year, is without you, uh, my job would be impossible. Uh, you guys have such a vigilance about principles of copyright, making sure that our site actually reflects the values our, com our community wants. And as a result, we take down things that shouldn't be there. And we tend to end up handling a number of issues uh, that needs to be either escalated or you need a different point of view. But I think this is a good moment to express my gratification to you for actually being the wiki lawyers that you are and being so effective at it. So, um, Daisy is our paralegal. Um, she's back in San Francisco, but she keeps us all in order. So let me now sort of go to um, the strategy itself and talk about the four pillars. Um, our first pillar is defense and litigation, and with respect to community content as well as community values. What on a daily basis, and we receive hundreds of these each year, uh, someone like Michelle or Stephen. Uh, will be on the phone with attorneys, either in the United States or globally, 
um, explaining to them that we are refusing to take down community content, no matter what their legal arguments are. And they have to be multi-skilled, because they're able to make the arguments legally. Sometimes they have to explain the facts of life, like the Streisand effect. Um, sometimes they have to simply say, no, if you want to sue us, go ahead and sue us. And they're quite successful at it. We have, we're 95% successful at keeping content up in what we call serious threat scenarios. Um, the other 5% are usually the DMCA takedown notices that you see, uh, which um, we don't like doing, but sometimes we have to under the um, US uh, legal regime. The second point is litigation. I, I made a decision about two years ago that we were going to show up internationally in court and we were going to defend uh, our community's content. And we think uh, the results of that decision, not just mine, but the organization in general, um, are now beginning to show some fruit. Um, as uh, those from Italy know, we recently won the Preventi case, the guys from Ferrosconi, uh, and it was quite successful and widely reported. We've had two successful um, uh, wins in German courts, as well as the internet brands dealing with Wiki Voyage and the attempt by that company um, to sue users of our Wiki Voyage uh, community. Um, last year, when I was standing before you, I told you that I wanted to put in place a uh, policy that was called the Legal Fees Assistance Program. And that was to uh, provide, in appropriate circumstances, uh, funding and to hire lawyers to protect our administrators, our functionaries, if necessary. And um, it has now been in place, uh, approved by the board some time ago. And we actually are using it and spending our budget money you know, for that purpose. Now, what, was, um, what we were able to emphasize during that time, there's always been in place a policy for community members where when in fact, um, in cir circumstances, for example, where they're uploading truthful content and they're wrongfully being told by governments or third parties to take it down, we have a program, a budget, where we will uh, find and hire um, lawyers um, on the user's behalf uh, to uh, defend themselves. And we're actively doing that too. We have active cases along those lines. Now we don't talk about it um, in specifics because for legal strategic reasons, there are reasons not to do so. But we do spend quite a bit of our time um, worrying about those cases, strategizing them, and figuring them out with um, good results. Um, another thing, and boy, Michelle, she's been persistent in telling me that we need this. She's been doing it for uh, almost a year now, and I finally, uh, and I always thought it was a good idea, but we never had the resources. But I think I can fairly say today uh, that we do. And that's to start putting together a transparency report, and that's in our plan this year. Uh, be reporting back on government requests for information, third party requests for information, and to, to give you some visibility, for example, at that 95% uh, figure that I just cited. So, this is our first pillar, defense and litigation. It's probably our most important one in my mind because it's so closely tied to what we are all about, the writing encyclopedia, ensuring truthful, free information is available. The second <coughs> pillar is privacy. And it's privacy, thinking about privacy uh, in more than simply a policy. It's easy to have a policy, but you also have to put processes behind that policy because uh, it's not a policy if you're not living up to it. We're, we're, our privacy policy, I think it dates from like 2008 or something like that, probably when you first arrived. And it's really time to, um, to update it. And what we want to do is, we expect to do it in about a month, is publish on, uh, publish on Meta um, a draft privacy policy for community collaboration. So for some of you who may be following the issue, there has been a one month or so, a little longer than a month, consultation uh, where we've asked the community to start giving us some ideas and there've been some really constructive thoughts um, in that um, collaboration. Michelle is, went back, uh, drafted a privacy policy. We've gone through a thousand reviews on it. Um, we've been working very closely with tech on it. And as I say, it will come out in about a month. And there are some other related policies that will accompany it. And there's some things that we're thinking about. The first important one is we want extensive community consultation on this. So we're anticipating it will be at least four months and probably six months where we'll have exchanges and we will actually update the draft in real time as we're getting feedback from you. 
some things that we're, um, as we write, wrote the policy and that we'll be uh, probably talking about is, I think what's amazing about our organization is that compared to others, we uh, gather relatively uh, little amount of data. But I think it's really important in this privacy policy to be transparent on how we use that data. And that means using plain English, giving uh, specific examples, and explaining why we're doing that. And you will see that in the draft that we'll be rolling out. Uh, we do want to have an easier user experience, and that does mean, for example, we, will, uh, we are using cookies. We want to be able to explain that. We want people to understand that. We want to create a, an experience on our site, which means that we uh, are not going to ignore the data we have, but obviously we'll use it in very limited and explicit ways. One thing that has, uh, I'll be honest, uh, I, I came to the foundation about two and a half years ago, and there was an ongoing debate uh, among uh, stewards and check users, and it's taken me a while, but I'm almost gaining the courage to start that debate again. And um, I think it's going to probably happen uh, with the privacy policy being rolled out. Uh, for me, it's really important that um, check users who have access uh, to your um, non-private data, that that data, that th those check users are identified, we know who they are, and they actually undertake a pledge of confidentiality. And that will be something that will be possibly controversial uh, that we're anticipating. We think we have good reasons for it. We definitely want to hear your views on it. And definitely come up and talk to us about it here at Wikimania. Because maybe there are ways of doing it that we haven't thought of. But um, we're going to uh, be talking about that as well. So that's our second pillar uh, strategy uh, this, um, this coming year. Our third is trademarks. Uh, now don't worry, we're not going to be putting a thousand policies out there at the same time. We're going to stage it a little bit, but not too much. Um, I anticipate a few months after the uh, privacy policy, we're going to start taking a real strong look at trademarks. Uh, there's already an extensive statement that we posted, um, what, what is it, a couple of months ago? Uh, something like that, yeah, in June. And where we were, um, we, have, we haven't written anything yet, uh, or it, we just started if we have. Um, we really uh, are trying to figure out how we redo this in a way that really makes a lot of sense. And so in that statement, we set out things that we worry about from a legal perspective and places where we want to go. Now, for me as general counsel, uh, my mandate that I've given to Yana uh, is pretty clear. I want the most liberal use of our trademarks by our community that's possible legally. The only condition I tell Yana is I don't want to be the general counsel that loses the puzzle below trademark. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we push the envelope as much as we can on the use of our trademarks, but I want to make sure it stays within the realm of um, legal protection. Um, as you know, and so we're, we've been taking feedback and we want to put together uh, uh, this new trademark policy. We'll have a consultation period again of four to six months. Obviously, we want to make sure we prevent um, confusion. We want to avoid something that's called naked licensing. Naked licensing means that when you just let your trademark be used by anyone in any situation, you start losing any rights to that trademark and controlling it. So people, for-profit organizations, can start using it to promote their own products. Uh, the, our trademark can be used so that if it were nakedly licensed uh, for the profit of individuals. And of course, that would do a disservice to the hard work in the community, because at the end of the day, the trademark represents the goodwill of the community. Um, but at the same time, we need to be imaginative about allowing for liberal use of that trademark to promote our mission, because although you know, the foundation may technically own the trademark, that really doesn't matter for our mission, because our community has built, it's what built that brand, not the foundation. And so we need to make sure that our trademark serves the community. And I really want us to push the envelope a little bit more on that. I think we need more clarity. We need more examples in our trademark as to when people can use our trademark. I think people find it confusing. Um, I think we have to figure out ways of licensing easily when a license is possible. Many times there won't be uh, any need for a license in certain circumstances. Uh, we don't expand to narrow anything in our present trademark policy, but we're trying to think of ways that we can expand. So that's our third pillar in our strategy. And our fourth pillar is governance. Um, 
Now, boy, that sounds like a really boring word, governance. Um, sounds like a legal word. But when you put it in a context, it's actually pretty important. Uh, governance is making sure, for example, that we're spending donors' money appropriately for the mission. Governance is making sure that individuals for private interests aren't uh, hurting the community reputation. Uh, and so it's coming up with ways of making sure that we work together that is consistent with our mission and that we're using our resources consistently. Um, one example of that was, um, and again this was with community collaboration, was the guidelines on um, potential conflicts. And I, uh, it, it was, that was a good example of a document where with community input it got rewritten significantly because you guys really had a better view on how to handle some of the issues than I did. Uh, so, and in that guideline, it basically said, listen, if you want grant money from a chapter, or you want grant money from WMF, or you want to use the staff of a chapter, that has, you, and you have a personal conflict, a personal interest, a financial interest, you have to disclose that at a minimum. And then people can figure out how they're going to treat that conflict. But it's making us all aware that the resources that we have belong to the community, belong to the mission, not to individual uh, uh, not to individuals in the private interest. Um, so some things that we've done on movement uh, is like grant agreements. I, I, I imagine this is probably not what makes you excited every day, but I, 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 there was a period when I was pretty, um, I was, um, was getting around the office because we had just gotten some, um, we had drafted grant agreements with very easy to read user summaries. And that ensures that people at least understand uh, the basic requirements of a grant. Uh, one thing I'd like to uh, see if we could talk to you guys about is um, movement guidelines. Does that make sense? Would it be useful, for example, for us to, working with AFCOM, working with um, the movement organizations, including chapters, thematic organizations, um, I guess the new user groups, um, coming out with sort of a statement with community collaboration as to, well, what should you do if you're at stage one as a chapter? Um, you probably should at least have a conflict of interest policy. Uh, what do you do if you're at stage two or at stage three? Uh, you know, and would it be helpful to the community? Now, nothing like that, as we all know, is universal. Um, it cannot be a US-centric doc centric document. And um, governance is different in every country. But one of my questions I have is, would that be a useful thing? Um, the other thing is that the board is working uh, with the uh, strong support of legal on a new uh, board handbook, which describes um, its processes, but also its codes of conduct. Um, it has sections describing um, uh, our movement, uh, and we're going to be publishing that on Meta when it's final and approved. And that may be a useful document just to understand how our board operates, that's a type of governance, but there may be parts of that on that handbook that would be helpful for movement organizations as well. Uh, and so we're trying to think of ways that we can be helpful Respect. So that's it. Uh, those are the four pillars um, that we have that we're focusing on uh, this year uh, in the legal department. Uh, the first one is being defense and litigation. The second one being privacy. The third, trademark. And the fourth, uh, being governance. Although keep in mind, that's only a small part of what we do as a legal department. Um, now, those are the pillars, but I think in some sense there has to be a foundation, and at the risk of being overly repetitive, uh, the, those uh, pillars only make sense unless you have, uh, only if you have a foundation of collaboration with the community, only if you have a foundation of getting the international voice into the discussion. Um, this is some, a place where I could really use help uh, in understanding how we'd be better how can, how can I get Wikimedians who don't speak uh, English to participate in these discussions? Now, what we've tried last year is um, we've professionally uh, translated a number of draft documents in about five or six languages. It's expensive to do that. Uh, I put aside some budget to be able to do that, so when we roll something out, it's in different languages, and it's not, a, it is simply a first step. They're professionally translated by legal translators, um, and it's, it's not, it's to help the community translators take it to the next level uh, without overly burdening them uh, with long legalistic documents. Um, so we've tried doing that, we've tried giving notices in uh, many different languages, um, and we're very grateful to members of the community to help uh, translate back into English uh, those voices. 
Um, but I'm, I don't think we do a great job at that, and I'm trying to still figure out how we do a better job. And I think the other thing that is part of the foundation to those pillars is um, respect. Um, we have, uh, our team tremendously respects the community and the ideas of the community. And it's really important that we're never perceived as talking down to the community or acting like jerky lawyers. Um, if we do that, we're not doing our job. And so um, it's, we, um, we want to set up um, ways that we can listen, and we're doing that with um, collaboration and things like that. Because you guys have a lot of great ideas. So I want to thank you very much uh, for all you've done. I thank you for the honor of being able to be part of the mission uh, as the legal team. And so those are, um, that's, um, that's the end of my talk. That's sort of the strategies and the things that we're thinking about. So we're definitely open to questions or any discussions you want. So why don't we bring the chairs around and we can turn it into a round table type of thing.
As far as office actions, we end up doing um, less than, uh, far less than one per year on average. Um, so that's, um, it's, it's an incredibly rare thing. Um, I know that we've done one since I started. Yeah, I, I can't think of one. We've actually removed some from office protection recently, but it's, uh, we don't actually do them very often. And as far as our relationship with the oversight community, um, oversighters are, uh, on the English Wikipedia in particular, they're appointed by the arbitration committee. Um, and uh, I would say are responsible through the arbitration committee to the community. Um, but we would, we would, um, we would very rarely use the privacy policy to, to, uh, um, to in some in a situation like that. So, uh, if you'd like to talk to me later, I can maybe give you some specifics and see if I can figure out what happened there. But that's it. Probably most of you know that that's Philippe, the uh, head of community advocacy. Um, so he's not really part of the legal team. He just tells us how to do it. He just comes and talks for us all the time. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm Jack Lee. Um, I actually teach law, but nothing is related to you, I think. Um, but I also do work on commons, and I noticed that at commons we have a lot of legal problems trying to interpret what copyright laws are in different countries, and I was wondering how much support um, the legal team gives. And, I think it's not very much. And do, does that mean we need to strengthen it in some, uh, in some case? Or at least build up a network of people who can advise us about copyright laws in 150 countries? Because we get all these debates about is this allowable, is it not allowable? And I get the feeling that we're all just, you know, the blind native likes, none of us are, or a lot of us are not really lawyers, or not lawyers um, conversant in a certain type of law from a certain jurisdiction. So unfortunately, um this is what the answer employers love the most is that it depends. Um, <laughs> with copyright, it's almost never black and white, and we're in an un unfortunate situation in which we can't legally advise you on the specific issues of copyright. Um, what we've been trying to do recently is been trying to give general um, guidelines and within the bounds of our legal ethics that are the things that prevent us from giving you direct as to whether this specific measure can, uh, is allowable under US law or French law, etc. Um, so in that sense, we are trying to do what we can. It's on a place called WikiLegal um, that you can find on Meta. And whenever you do have a question like that, and we're, it's within our ability to answer or at least give some guidance, we will. Um, you can definitely send any questions you have to legal.wikilegal.org. And we will be very upfront about the extent of which we can help you. Um, but really, it is up to the community as to what they think should and shouldn't be um, appearing on commons and whether they think that it's permissible or not. And when we do get uh, demands to have things taken down by alleged copyright holders, we will fight back when we think it's not a legitimate takedown request. Um, but you know, if it does actually meet all the criteria and it is appropriate to request, that's when we yeah, I'd like to, um, if I could just say, Bruce, I, I'd like to sort of put a strong plug in for uh, WikiLegal. Sometimes I say WikiLeaks, it's actually WikiLegal. <laughs> uh, and um, what we do is we have a team, and Michelle puts this team together. We have a very competitive legal intern program where we will get hundreds of applications every semester, and law students uh, uh, from around the country come in and they work uh, as part of our educational program. And they will often do initial research that we'll take a look at. Um, we'll post it on Wiki Legal, in, in, uh, obviously on Wiki, and uh, and it's actually a detailed start of the discussion on the legal uh, point. We encourage the community to edit freely, edit that, uh, leave comments, ask additional questions, uh, and but surprisingly, we haven't get in, gotten that many questions these last the last two semesters. I'm saying that to. I forgot speaking with Stephen just a, a little bit. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, legal interns. Well, I, I was actually about to say, as an example of the kind of, uh, of, the kind of thing that we can do, um, we've known for a little while that there was some confusion in the Wikidata community. And uh, I think this is a good example of the, of the kinds of ways that the question can be asked. 
uh, somebody from the community put together a pile of examples for us and said, you know, here we have a bot that's doing this, we have a bot that's doing that. Um, you know, we're not sure about this particular nuance of Creative Commons. They sort of they bundled it together into a question and left it on. It was one of our legal talk pages, I don't remember which one, but left it, I think, on the Wiki Legal Talk page saying, hey, can we get a, can, can we get some, some wisdom and guidance on this? And you know, Jeff mentioned our interns, and he said uh, interns from around the country. Uh, this summer, actually for the first time, uh, we have a legal intern who's, a, uh, who's from Germany, uh, is actually a, a DE uh, chapter member, and uh, is putting together uh, a memo right now as we speak, no pressure on him if he's you know, following us on the internet, uh, on I really hope he doesn't screw that one up. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean it is it is you know nine a.m. nine p.m. at night uh, in San Francisco, so I'm sure he's safely in bed. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, he you know is putting together a package of answers based on those. You know we can't specifically, like Michelle said, we can't specifically advise on specific situations. But having those examples of exactly what the concerns are is going to help us write a good. Uh, background package on what our database rights, how our database rights license, um, and uh, you know, so I, I mean, I think that's a, a good example of the kind of thing that we can do, and hopefully we'll be publishing that soon. Uh, but I think the question, I think the question's right there on the top page. You can go look at the, uh, at the discussion. So. I think it's on Meta uh, <coughs> Wiki Legal. Uh, I think it's actually pretty Googleable. I think if you just yeah, type you Meta Wiki Legal, you get to the right place. Wiki Legal will come up maybe like the or something. Um, and uh, so you're right, we have a German uh, intern, and we may have an um, intern from Colombia. Uh, and so we're trying to be international, and what Jana didn't tell us that she's not an American at all. Uh, she's actually European, and she's on our team. Europe and also the US. So how, how many languages do we have on the team there? Uh, we speak five languages fluently. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, if we, I'd like to ask about uh, one of these specifically, one of the uh, DMCA takedown notices that you have another. I'd like to ask about uh, just some specifics about one of the DMCA takedown notices, probably the most visible one I think I remember on how was the last year. The Clyde Zoltenberg sculptures, just to refresh other people in the audience who may not have been aware of this, we received a takedown notice from the Oldenburg Foundation for several photos of uh, Clay's work, some of which are installed in Germany, where the general perception is that freedom of panorama applies to public artwork in public locations. And I think, and I think we had to comply with that one. The ultimate explanation was, you know, I sort of understand this, but I would like to hear some more details. Was that the feeling was that, in a, you know, the in the conflict of laws, you know, that applied, American law would be considered to prevail, even though the statute, the um, sculptures themselves, the installations were in Germany. And if someone could uh, provide a little bit more detail on that. I think that falls to you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very unfortunately. So I think it's important first to understand that I certainly did not want to take down those images. Um, unfortunately, within the US, uh, we don't recognize the freedom of panorama that is commonly recognized, particularly around Europe. Um, what we do have is something called the Architectural Works of Copyright Act. And that does cover the ability for people to walk around on the street and take pictures of buildings and not be infringing the copyright of the architectural elements of a building. However, that doesn't expand to, um, say, public sculptures or public works of art. Um, and what we had received, I believe, back in November of last year uh, was a DMCA takedown notice regarding 59 images by a particular um, sculptor. And these sculptures were installed uh, throughout the world, including the US and um, in Europe. And they were still under copyright. And we had looked into it for quite a bit to see whether there was any possible way that we could just um, essentially say that the DMCA takedown notice was invalid. Unfortunately, we, in consultation with your 
European attorneys um, got discovered that there was no way for us to not comply with it. Um, so we ended up taking down the images and we, of course, were open to having um, any members of the community or any members of the public um, be willing to take down, uh, sorry, submit a counter notice. Unfortunately, um, that didn't happen and so the images are still down. So if you're any member of the community, you can submit a Yes. <laughs> there's a caution to that because yeah. you, you take on, you're making certain representations factually it's not a valid claim, and you would uh, definitely want to just not do it. You would need to, you know, a lawyer's advice is to make sure you get a lawyer before you do that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You're so any, any time I say something uh, scary, the lights go out. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe that will Yes. I'll connect both Conversation, not with the legal team, with other other uh, contributors, is that since the Wikimedia servers are based in the U.S., so the U.S. law prevails uh, the rest of the laws where, where Wikipedia is written or, or read. Now, to the best of my knowledge, not all servers are in the U.S. Perhaps they are owned by a U.S. Uh, non-profit. So anyway, is that true? Is that statement true? Servers are really not the only consideration as to who has jurisdiction over a company. A lot of different factors come into play, especially depending on the laws of the country that's attempted to claim jurisdiction. Um, it can be where the company is headquartered, uh, where they have people on the ground or offices, um, where the supposed injury of whatever someone is claiming has occurred. Um, so it is a slightly more complicated analysis than the servers. But yeah, no, it's I just want to kind of flag what, what Michelle said, which is that um, that is the law in the U.S., right? So in the U.S., that we have that extra analysis, which means that since we are based in the U.S., um, we would fall under that analysis where primarily we would look to where our, um, our headquarters are located, where, our, uh, where we incorporated, right? things like that. And so even if we ended up having servers somewhere abroad, that would mean that those servers would not be subject to US jurisdiction. Um, those servers could potentially be subject to other countries' jurisdictions, uh, but they would not be exempt from US jurisdiction. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, when we look to that analysis, we're, we're kind of grateful that servers are subject to US jurisdiction, because um, jurisdiction, jurisdiction does uh, very much protect speech um, in a way that um, other countries do not. Um, there is no um, CD230 equivalent anywhere around the world. There's now a, um, a law that is kind of closed um, in the UK, but it is the sort of closest um, law that we've seen um, throughout history. And it still does not reach um, the same kind of immunity that CD230 provides. So, um, so in that sense, it's really, you know, we, we would like to be subject to the other thing For the is... For non-lawyers, can you explain what CDA 230 is? Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought we were the lawyers in the room. <laughs> um, CDA 230 essentially applies to intermediaries, um, and um, there was also a legal clip I didn't hear. Stephen laugh at me, so I'm, I'm going to step back and, and, and uh, explain that as well. Um, essentially, it applies whenever there's... Whenever we have a site like ours, where someone... Um, where third parties are essentially posting content um, and um, on the site, and, and so we, we don't have control over that content. And if we do not have control over that content, we have immunity um, liability um, based on, on that content um, under CD. Um, in other words, in a lot of places, if we host the server, even if we didn't put the content up, we can get arrested. 
uh, in the US, it is quite clear uh, the people who own the servers, who run the servers, right? So, yeah, <laughs> mostly Jeff, right? So, yeah, so in, in the US, it is, quite, it is quite clear as a matter of law right now that if one of you puts something uh, up on the servers, which is in some way questionable, uh, we can't be, except under really crazy circumstances, we can't be liable for that, right? And that's what allows us, uh, that security and certainty is what allows us to allow all of you to put things on the servers, right? If, uh, if we didn't have that protection, we'd have to look at every single file that got uploaded, because otherwise, you know, we'd be on the hook, right? And so that protection uh, is what sort of allows the whole system to function in this room. Um, and actually, if I could jump into uh, this is sort of a follow-up question for all of you, uh, which is not to say that you should all try to grab the mic to answer me, but I'd be, uh, you know, but I'd be curious to hear your feedback. Uh, we recently found out, and we're going to post a blog post uh, probably next week uh, uh, about a threat to this particular law in the U.S. Um, some folks are trying to poke a loophole in it, uh, which would be big enough to be very threatening. Um, and uh, so we'd like to get more involved in uh, advocating against this change, right, so that we can protect uh, the ecosystem that we've got. Uh, and so the question to you all, and again, th this is homework, ticket home, drop me an email later. Um, what, if you have good ideas is um, how can we have that discussion with you about what kinds of advocacy, advocacy is appropriate, what kinds of steps are appropriate to take. You know, we're very conservative about acting on the behalf. Uh, and, uh, you know, so this is one of the things that we're thinking about is how can we do this? How can we reflect your values, our values, um, you know, while still uh, using your name and, and using the, the goodwill that you've developed? So that's something, you know, advocacy advisors, some of you are probably on that list. If more of you want to join that list and join that discussion, uh, that'd be a great move. And uh, just a plug, if you're curious about how CDA 230 affects Wikipedia, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation Deep Links blog hosted a rather detailed interview with Michelle on the topic. So it goes into why CDA 230 is important for making Wikipedia possible. And I'll put a link for that up soon. Okay, just. Uh, Completely different question. First, a follow up on, on, on the Alden Bell question. We, we have a panel more at I think two o'clock on, on not a panel, a lecture on the subject and why I personally think she made the mistakes. But um, yeah. that's tomorrow. And a different question uh, on a different subject, subject of jurisdiction. Um, the local chapter and the local volunteers who answer the OTRS many times receive demands and they wonder how to reply to these demands. And that's a question of may result in a question of jurisdiction. When you get a local takedown notice for an article, something is wrong in it, and even, even if everything is fine, whatever you send back, you expose that volunteers to claim. And if the local chapter responds on behalf of the, of the volunteer, he may be exposed to claim. And at one point, if anything goes back to the foundation, then the jurisdiction of that country may apply to the foundation. It may be, uh, the foundation may be pulled to litigate the case in the certain country. I could not find any instructions on how to pass the information whether it should be passed, because even passing such notice to the foundation may result in having it uh, having to litigate in the country. So, so. If, if you do ever receive something that you're not comfortable answering with, please don't be concerned about our risk in terms of sending it to us. I'm happy to take on that risk. That's not a position that you should be taking on if you don't feel comfortable answering. Um, scary easy, it's fine. Okay, you guys can send it. But um, I did want to go into a little bit more detail about the um, So I think generally you, the claim that you would want to say uh, in order to keep the pictures that were taken in countries that recognize freedom of panorama up is you would want to claim that the law of the country where the photograph was taken um, is the law that should apply. And while I definitely agree with you, uh, the Ninth Circuit does not agree with me. So, <laughs> and we're in the Ninth Circuit of the United States, and that's the precedent that I'm looking at. Um, so, what I made my decision um, on was because most likely um, Mr. Oldenburg would have been suing in the U.S., and 
if he was smart suing in the Ninth Circuit. Um, the conflict of copyright laws has generally been decided in the Ninth Circuit as the applicable law is the, the law of the country where the infringement occurred. And the Second Cir Circuit has also said that um, regardless of where it was created, when a work is protected under U.S. copyright law, it is infringed anywhere within the U.S. The U.S. laws concerning the scope of rights and the procedure and the defense and the remedies are all going to be U.S. law. Um, that is why I thought that U.S. law would be applying it as opposed to the law of the freedom of panorama countries. Now, while I also mm -hmm. think that maybe the law of the freedom of panorama countries should be the one that is applicable, um, because of the, the risk and precedent that I had researched, as well as um, just the fact that I wish that our we had expanded our own laws to the freedom of panorama, this was a very difficult decision for me to make, and I understand why you may disagree with it. I disagree with the basis that I had to make it up, but uh, that's kind of where I started. It was a tough decision, and it was well researched, and we consulted uh, foreign counsel as well. And I think one of the things, um, first of all, the thing I'd like to confirm is Michelle does not scare easily. Uh, <laughs> and oftentimes when you see uh, our, uh, our DMCA take down this, let me remind you, it's part of that 5%, not the 95% where every day Michelle is fighting very hard to keep the content up. I see there are other questions, but we're at the end of our hour. So I, I see that as an encouraging sign that you may come up and talk to us and hunt us down at uh, Wikimania so that we can answer any of the remaining questions. Uh, I, I wish we had more time to do that, but I think we have an uh, interesting uh, presentation, exciting, uh, another exciting legal-like presentation uh, that, uh, so I'll hand it over uh, to Lewis.